Good afternoon, everyone. We are live. Are we live? Okay, this is fun. We're just testing out the waters. Um, bear with us. We are hoping to get entrepreneurial marketing strategist. There Hello, everyone. Producer here, just starting your music. I forgot that you can't hear it if you can't have me on. So here comes our intro. Welcome the Rise everybody. Today inspirational podcast is brought to you by two relentless health warriors, Dr. Erica Harris, an empowered mindset health expert who is the passionate founder of risetoday.com and Megan Hubner, an entrepreneurial marketing strategist and founder of Hubner Marketing. These two inspirational forces have truly thrived through adversity and are here to empower you to do the same. Together, they serve to open up the conversation about hardship and to move you to greatness through your adversities. Learn more at risetoday.com forward slash podcast. Now, let's get started. Let's rise today, right here, right now. It's a good day. Hey, Bree. Hey, Bree. Woo! We are hoping that you love our little dance party, and we are so excited to be back with you here with the Rise Today Inspirational Podcast. We took a little hiatus. I had a little surgery last month and a little recovery time, and Megan and I are both so excited to be back and sharing these incredibly inspirational stories, which we truly hope you find a value in navigating your everyday and in opening up the conversation about hardship. And here we share tools to stay the course and to thrive. We are super excited today to open up the conversation about PTSD, the very important conversation about PTSD. And we are really happy to have Chris Revel with us today. Chris Revel has started the Let's Chat podcast with Chris Revel in 2013, and he's released over 200 episodes to date. His podcast has been featured in Vulture, Huffington Post, and has grown into the video podcast Let's Chat, where Revel co-hosts with Let's Chat media co-founder Bree Benjamin. On the rare occasion he's not working, Chris enjoys his time with his wife, Victoria, and their three-and-a-half-year-old, Felicity. Love that name. Oh, Chris has spent the last decade working as a frontline healthcare worker. He serves as a caseworker, working with behavioral health and with substance abuse. And we are so lucky to have Chris with us today, where he can share his insights and his personal story. Megan, will you please help me welcome Chris to the show? Hello, Chris. Thank you for joining us today. And hello, everyone who is joining us live from whatever outlet it is. We're thrilled to have you here. This is our first go at a live session. So here we go. This is really exciting. Um, Chris, can you tell us a little bit more? Thank you so much for your introduction, Erica. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and what really got you started in this entire area that you're working. Uh, in my job job or the podcast? Either or. I mean, I think they're probably pretty directly tied together. Yeah, but, see, you know, um, we're talking about PTSD. Yeah. So. I ended up working in, like, the behavioral health field. Um, like like a lot of people, I kind of unintentionally fell into it. Um, in a lot of ways, is one of those things. Um, when I, I was born with a heart condition as a kid, and then I went to, and then for years, I worked at the summer camp for kids with heart conditions. And so that was just, like, a volunteer thing for years. Uh, and then I met my now wife. Um, she was living in Providence, and I was living in Connecticut. And I was looking for work, uh, just trying to find a way to move to Rhode Island. And, you know, you, you do the thing. I, I was graduated out of college. I had the sociology degree. I was just trying to figure something out. And I ended up getting a job working in a group home for adults with developmental disabilities. I did that for about a year. It was really great. And then the next jump from that was uh, kind of I started working more community mental health. And then from that, it's kind of now I'm... Um, now my, I work at a, at a, I'm an outpatient at a hospital as a, like a caseworker or a case manager now. And yeah, it's, it's one of those things I'm sure if anyone else notices, you just kind of look back, you're like, oh yeah, I did a lot of things. Like I was never, it was not the intention, but it just kind of seemed like every job I would take and like excel and really like was in the field and then just kept growing and moving around and growing within the field. So it's, it's been, it's, it's, you know, as I'm sure, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. I bet. Incredible insights that you've gained on that path as well. Now, take us back, Chris. I know um, we've talked talked a lot about this topic of PTSD. Take yeah. us back to the story that really brought this all out. Yeah, sure. So, and 
ironically, I just want to point out, even though I work with behavior, I work in like this field and I literally, I've worked with so many survivors of PTSD. I know the symptoms. I know what you're supposed to look out for. I know everything about it. I've read tons about it. Uh, I didn't, couldn't rec like anyone, I'm not sure, you know, you can't recognize it in yourself. <laughs> so um, the long story, the reason I had the PT, what I had the PTSD is uh, when my, my daughter Felicity was born, my wife had a very traumatic birth. Uh, she had, uh, she had a, very, uh, she had developed preeclampsia. Then a couple of days later, we then had a C-section, and then she had uh, it just like a lot of postpartum bleeding. It, in that the day she gave birth, she had a C-section plus three surgeries, and we almost lost her. We're very happy she's still with us today. Wow. And then it was our first child. My daughter spent about a week in the NICU, a little over a week in the NICU, and um, that was after a long struggle of uh, about a, a three and a half year struggle with IVF. So um, you know, I thought everything was going fine, like. But you know, I don't know if anyone, if any of you have children, but like it's hard to tell what's not right because you're already not eating right, you're not sleeping right, your entire life has just changed. So I wasn't, it wasn't clear that something was wrong, and um, I remember I had a pain in my neck, like a really bad pain in my neck, and I went to get a massage thinking that would do the trick, and then it like still hurt, and I, I got to a point like I couldn't move, a do doctors couldn't figure it out. I, I was about to go, and then one day my wife, and this is I uh, kind of humorous, she goes, have you thought of talking to someone? And I had seen the therapist before in the past, but I just had, I graduated, I, I had completed seeing that therapist at some point and had not been seen one. I was like, yeah, I guess, yeah, not, not a bad idea. So I go see a therapist, give her my whole story. I get diagnosed with PTSD. And I was like, Victoria, why did, why did you think to even think that? She's like, you're going to laugh at me. But you started to remind me of Josh Lyman in the episode of The West Wing when he got uh, diagnosed with PTSD. Wow. Uh, I was like, yeah. She's like, yeah, I remember that was Josh. So that was how I uh, kind of ended up on it, which is still ironic because I feel like I, I guess logically it seems like you should know this because I, I noticed all like in retrospect, I was like, oh yeah, flashbacks and all that stuff. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't recognizing me. I wasn't recognizing it. And I think the thing that really concerned her most was the, uh, the waking up screaming part that I would have no memory of, like the night terror stuff. Wow, wow. So, tell, us, yeah. tell us about all of these symptoms. So obviously yeah. you're having aches and pains, mm -hmm. you're yeah. waking up at night. What yeah. else were you experiencing these flashbacks? Like when would they hit? Yeah, mine, because it, it, no, it affects everyone so differently. Mine were so strange. It was um, whenever I'm not busy, whenever my mind would actually be a little calm, um, I remember frequently driving and then I would just be somewhere and my shirt would be wet. My face would just be covered. And I have no idea how I got there. And like, you kind of like, uh, my therapist actually kind of calls it, he's like, it's almost like time travel. He goes, my therapist, who's a very funny guy, he calls it, um, he calls it bad time travel because when you're having a flashback, it, it it's hard to explain, but you're living in the, for me, like the worst experience of my entire life and your entire life. So like, mm -hmm. It was almost, I don't want to use the word astro projection, but I was, I would physically be out of my body and I was back in the NICU, but I could see, yeah, and I would be able to like, I would be able to touch the floor. I could smell stuff. I could, I could it's very, very vivid. And it was oh, very, 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 very often when driving, that was always, yeah, pretty much that's exactly what it was. That's she, that's actually uh, my the, who we mentioned the bio. That's that's my business partner producer, one of my best buds, Bree. We love her. Uh, yeah. So they just yeah always. It was a lot of time driving. Anytime, anytime I had to think about it, I would try to avoid it, which you know would ultimately make it worse. So anytime I would, so I would always just try to distract myself. And then anytime I would have, anytime the thoughts wandered, is when it would kind of creep in. And then you're like grocery shopping or you're doing something, and all of a sudden you're just like, how did I get here? Huh? It it was uh, it was it's it was not good. <laughs> what tools what tools would you use in that moment to to shift from that? Like if you're standing yeah. in the middle of a grocery store and this strikes, how how do you move forward? Unfortunately, I wasn't, but eventually I did. Uh, when I when I finally did when I finally ended up finding doing that, uh, a lot of grounding techniques are really good. Um, you know, your your box breathing is really fun, or you just um, you count to. Uh, counting my breath to 10 and repetitions and I hit 10, I start over. Uh, one of my favorite ones is standing up on my tippy toes and going up and down and up and down and up and down until hmm. just until my legs have no energy left. Cause then it's just, one. Like, yeah, that's one of, that's mm -hmm. a, probably my favorite. That's one I find I use the most even now it, and stuff like that. Or then I would have um, a list of like, I would have to like use my grounding techniques and I would have like, I had like, 
at one point I used to like have a piece of paper on me and I would like write down like people or names or something just super specific to pull me back be like Felicity, Victoria, Carol, Bill, Aaron, like that's my, my family. And that would be enough just to like, just something to be like, okay, okay, we could, we can get through this. And then eventually kind of work and work through that. And then so my PTSD is, my experience is so different than a lot of people, uh, probably many people is, um, because of this, I ended up find I found a therapist I worked with who I absolutely loved. Then my jobs, my company changed their insurance. So I lost my insurance. So I was starting my recovery, uh, like in very more typical uh, CBT, DBD style. And then did some therapist shopping. And then I un complete, just was kind of at my wits end. And I was like, you know what? I love this coffee shop. I'm just gonna go to the place next door. And by chance, I ended up getting connected with my current therapist who was an EMDR therapist. And at this point I had never heard of EMDR therapy. And that, that was the thing that really changed everything for me. That's where I feel like I was, the recovery really was able to start. And what is this story The EMDR? What is it? Uh, it's eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy. Uh, so I went to see this, my, the, I started with this new, I was been working with a therapist for about six months uh, CBT, TBT style, then a few month gap. I met this new therapist by chance who did EMDR therapy. I had no idea what it was, which is, um, it's uh, Dwight, our producer can probably explain a little better than I am, but I know it's a lot of it is like with the left brain and uh, the right brain, like you hold these buzzers. It's a lot of working with your subconscious. It very feels like you're much in a dream. Uh, so like working with my therapist, we would actually like, you know, get, get, you, you do like a safety assessment and everything. And then you, we would go back into that trauma while I'd be hosing these buzzers and they put your eyes in an eye, eye movement. So it's very much like living through a lucid dream. So what it allows you to do is it suppresses the part of your brain that feels like the physical parts of trauma. So it allows you to actually work through it. So from working with my EMD, working with my therapist, I was, I'm, I'm happy to say I, I don't have PTSD anymore because of that. And it's, wow. yeah, know. it's incredible. Military, a lot of government and military use it. It's, it's, it's honestly, it, it sounds like it's hard. I knowing myself from the past, I guess a skeptic. I was like, there's no way this works. It sounds like woo world. This is stupid. There's a lot of science to back it up, but even the field is split on it. But my therapist so wisely said to me one day, he's like, Chris, a placebo effect is still an effect. It's like, if it works and you don't know why, just go with it. I was like, yeah. All right. I actually heard a lot about it in the last couple of weeks, yeah. it seems. So it's, it's interesting that even you just continue on the path and you think, okay, this therapist, I, it's not quite clicking. And you keep looking. So you really have to be an advocate for, okay, yeah. how, doing a gut Absolutely. check with yourself. Is this feeling good? Is it working? Yeah. Am I seeing the progress that I want? And then you just keep going until you find something. So I have heard actually about this a lot it, in the yeah. last couple of weeks. As soon as you call it into your awareness, you're going to start it's, to hear more people. Yep. You're so right. And honestly, it, it, it's unbelievable. It works lightning fast. Like I walked out of the session at a 10 and I left there at a two only because I was in disbelief. I, and then, you know, we've continued our EMDR therapy. And like most people, um, I got more of a proper diagnosis as I went on in my treatment with more of like uh, CPTSD. So then, then we got to do more fun work. He's like, well, let's explore that C and let's go all the way back to childhood and find every little thing. And it's very much like having a dream, but you're still in control. And it's hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. And that includes being a parent. It is the hardest thing. I mean, it is, I, I it drains me in an emotional level. Like I don't even know, but the, the flip side is it, 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 it's helped me in every aspect of my life beyond just the PTSD. That was like, I went there for PTSD and walked away with so much more from that. It wow. was an experience. Wow. Yeah, it's changed every, it changed my entire life for the best. And wow. Wow. It, it's nice. Cause now I like, love, Sorry, I really love how you have drawn such a um, conclusive, I guess, um, match, if you would, between the physical thoughts running through your mind and the paralyzing of your body in those moments yeah. to the actual physical things that you're experiencing. And so I think yeah. by listing some of the physical symptoms that you are experiencing is going to allow everyone to sort of again, okay, wait a minute, would this be me? Do, do I feel so similar, similar? And recognizing that these it's it's so tightly ta attached right the thoughts oh. that we have in our mind and, yeah. and the actual physical output in our body it's, it's incredible it's like you know you could be like oh uh i'm having this emotional pain oh that's why my leg hurts it's it's incredible i don't have the chart with me but i have it at my office and yeah you know, and i i still look back i'm like i should have seen all this i should i i knew all this information but you, you, that's why we hire therapists because you can't, you need an outside perspective. You, you can't just, see it sometimes when you're in it. You just can't, you really can't. And yeah, it's, it's, it's no fun. I, it, you know, I, I, I'm, 
you know, I, I don't know, like, like I'm sure everyone, you don't want bad things to happen to you, but I'm glad that I was able to kind of come out on the other side of it and, and, and like really be, I'm, I'm very happy about that part of it. Obviously mm -hmm. there's the bad stuff to happen, but here we well, are. And the tools that you're sharing and how you're serving, it's just so truly inspirational. Like oh, thank you. You know, how, how incredible, right? That all of our listeners can take away, you know, okay, if, if I get struck with something with PTSD or one of these flashbacks from anything, right? Even if I don't have a diagnosis of PTSD, right? If I'm standing in a grocery store and I get this flashback of something, you know, I can stand on my tippy toes and repeat that until I'm physically exhausted from that. And that just distracts our thought patterns, right? And that rampant racing yep. of that self-talk that we often do or the breathing techniques, right? Whatever grounds us. I think that's a really incredible takeaway. And I know for myself on my own journey and as you were saying like we all have different experiences but i too would wake up in the middle of the night and i um would find myself sitting up totally straight so yes. yes. patting the bed frantically i would <laughs> patting my bed trying to feel for the the hospital bed rails next to me or the tubes coming out of me or mm -hmm. patting my head feeling for my bald head or feeling for my fingernails like mm -hmm. that I lost all of my fingernails and all of my toenails on this process and oh. then I could, I could literally hear the screams from patients from down the hall and yeah. you know all the beeps and all the buzzers that go off all night long in the hospital and in the icu and i would be breathless just trembling oh, yeah. and oh, yeah, uh, yeah and I would slowly come to open my eyes and then I would start to recognize that the walls around me <laughs> were purple, which I intens intensely, intentionally painted like a pinkish purple in my bedroom for this very reason, because it helps me recognize, okay, okay, I'm home, right? Like these are not the four white walls of my hospital room. And only then am I like, okay, I'm home. My boys are right down the hall. We did X, Y, Z today. And, yes. I, and I start to calm, right? And then for me, I'm overflowed, like flooded with emotion in that moment where with gratitude, just for the gift of getting to be alive on that yes. day. And because my story is so convoluted, right? And so I've come to shuff, like, shuffle and shift these very obvious episodes of post-traumatic stress attacks, right? But I've shifted that to what I refer to as my gratitude attacks because oh, I love that. they never let me forget how lucky I am to get to be alive still today, right? And, yes. um, and people always say, right? How are you so happy despite everything that you've gone through? But it's exactly this, like you can't hear the words of a two month terminal prognosis and really have a bad day after that because everything else is kind of gravy, right? Like there's nothing that can even come close to that gut wrenching hard day, right? Oh, and those, yes. those gratitude attacks of my post-traumatic stress really help me connect with that eternal gratitude that I bring to every day. So I've actually come as, as, as scary as those moments are, right? When oh, I yeah. don't know if I'm safe and I'm trying to ascertain my safety. And those are very scary, scary moments. Oh, so yeah. Coming, coming to realize that I am safe and my kids are right down the hall. It's just such a profound moment of gratitude. I love that you call it, you know, and that's one of the best tricks I too, like the cognitive reframe of like when something is negative, instead of saying like the example, like I have to get, to, it's like, I have to go to work and I'm stuck in traffic. And instead of, I, it's like, I get to go to work. I get to be in traffic. And I, to, to your point. Yeah. I, to get to do it. it. Yeah. And exactly. So much to your point. I, I can relate to everything you say too. Like the, the attacks when you're just not expecting it. And, 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 and triggers are so not like logical. It like, cause I could listen to someone tell a very similar story to what they had completely fine wouldn't be, it wouldn't bother me all but then i was holding my newborn daughter listening to um the book of love that peter is it peter gabriel i believe oh, yeah. Yeah. and just like all of a sudden like and first like oh it's a new baby of course i'm crying but and all of a sudden you're just like well, that was dangerous let's put her in the bassinet because i don't remember the last five minutes or it would be music beeping did you have that too because we also both it seems like we both have some at least some hospital layover did you find that like Sometimes if I hear like um, just like a beeping that would remind me of the the monitor my daughter would be on, sometimes yeah. that could just like, yeah. Oh, yeah, that one would always get me a lot. 
I don't really get it so much in the day. I still spend a lot of time visiting the hospital and I don't really experience these moments there. Um, I think because I always feel so, like I'm so lucky with the hospital that I'm at. I swear I've got like an entire institution of cheerleaders by my side every oh. step of the way there from nurses to caregivers or to um, cleaners and and um, porters and lunch ladies and everybody in between, right? I just have this huge institution of cheerleaders. So I actually don't experience it much in the day with beeps, buzzes, yes. even, even here at home. Um, but I definitely just wake up from, you know, the, the deepest of sleeps. And I'm just so, so startled. Yeah, because it's like, as my, my like, his trauma, you know, trauma, like, is, uh, you know, it's just, this is this is trauma. It's just a car going into a wall, and at some point we have to let the trauma finally work through. Yeah. And I know and it's the sleep. It's always. I, I guess I felt fortunate too that I was never aware of my night terrors. My my wife told me about them, and, and you know we had a we had a new baby like sleeping in our bassinet when all this was happening too, and the first time parents. So like I would wake up. Victoria's like, "You woke up, Felicity, last night." Like, what do you mean? Like you woke up screaming, or you were just kicking, or like you punched me, or I would wake up with black eyes sometimes because I would like hit myself. But I would just wake up and be like, have n I would have no memory of it. It would be completely erased. It was so. I think, yeah, odd. I think for me too, like, like you said, like that reframe was so important too, because it just, it just helps shift it to more of a positive experience, right? And yeah. yeah. Once you like, once you survive the worst day of your entire life, like even as hard as this pandemic has been, and believe me, it's been very hard. I'm, I'm been working through it every day and it, it's been, it's been horrible, but there's something that there's some gift to it. It's like, I'll we'll survive. Like the, at the deepest of moments at my core, I'm like, we're going to survive. You know, sometimes we're happy and sometimes we're surviving. And like at the, when the pandemic started, I was like, all right, this is survival mode. We've been here before. We know what to do. We're, we're going to get through this. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where it comes from. But like once you just once you have your biggest fear, like come true, like that was always my fear is like losing my wife. And then I'd be a single dad. Like that was always my fear. And then, you know, once you confront that, it just it changes you. It changes you at your core. And and I'm, I'm sure you have that same experience, but it also makes it makes the little things so much sweeter. Yeah. It just, like 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 doing like podcasts and stuff. Like it just everything just means so much more to me. I'm like this is so wonderful. Like just getting to connect with people. It just it it, it affects me in a way it never had before in a positive way. In a positive way. Yeah, and I think that's also important. Like this process of awareness, right? And just even talking about it and recognizing our own symptoms. Like first, we need to be aware, and then we can start that phase of going through the acceptance of it, right? And acceptance is really like when we're like, okay, I own this, but um, and I'm aware of it, but I don't let it stop me from my choices and pursuing my activities, right? So yeah, for those for those of us who get an episode as such perhaps or, or social anxiety walking into a grocery store right yeah it triggers as you're walking into the door or just as an example right and so somebody might be like shoot i don't want to go into the store today but that level of acceptance is like yes i recognize this i'm feeling this right now but pushing through that and using your tools in your toolbox to really progress through that so yes and whether these tools are you know reframing or standing on your tippy toes or deep breathing exercises, whatever those tools are, we all need to fill our toolboxes with those specific tools that, that we individually respond to. And I think this is all so great. Chris, I'm really happy that you are here to open up this. Oh, much this is so fun. That so many people struggle with without so in silence, right? Because um, they feel this stigma about it and they don't want to, they don't want to be real about it. And, um, and so this is really, really important to open up that conversation. And I really thank you for that. Oh, no, thank you. This has been so wonderful. Oh, one, one coping skill I forgot to mention, it's one of my favorites, is dancing. Like, oh. uh, I call it dancing for dopamine. Like, if I'm feeling a little down, if when I would get stuck like that, I have, like, I just, I love music. So I have all these, I have uh, some Spotify playlists that just have more upbeat, poppy music that no matter what mood you're in, you got to move. So when that would happen, if I'd be at work or something, I would just pop on this one playlist and be like, I don't even, even not even, not even good dancing, just even just like got to move. And just something about that was always just a way it's like, I, I would, it was actually the, the one song I'd always put on. It was the first song I played for my daughter when she was in the NICU was the Ronettes Be My Baby. So I would always put that song on because it would make me think of Felicity. And then like, all right. That, and that drums, does the just gets me every time. So I would just stand there and like, like it looks so silly. First it's like a wiggle, but then by the end of it, you're just like, yeah. And then you let free. And that, that, that is a really helpful one. I'm also a big fidgeter. That seems to help me as long as I can keep my hands moving. Like, that, that always helps me as well. Interesting. Really great tools. 
comedy, I think is another good one. If, you know, if we're home and able to do this, right. But if we're out at that grocery store, like you were talking about, those are great tools to be able to do on the yeah. phone that you shared. So that's really great. And, you know, to our listeners, we are so excited to be here live today. Today is a big show for us because we are very sadly saying goodbye to our dear co-host, Megan, who has brought such an amazing energy to our show. Megan is really busy pursuing a new course and moving into a different direction. And we are just so thankful for all that she has brought. So thank you. Thank you, my dear friend. It's been so fun to be on the Rise Today Inspirational Podcast with you for the last number of months, producing all these episodes, Dwight working hard in the background. And, you know, we've covered so many great topics that I hope all of you that have listened, that continue to listen, you know, I, I just feel that you, I hope that you get that groundswell, the groundswell that Erica is just so passionate about spreading about, to own this day, to enjoy the sunshine, to smell the fresh air, to spend the time with your family and friends and take in the small moments as Chris was just saying. Um, it's been so fun and I cannot wait to hear the new uh, discussions and chapters that you have moving forward. Love this. Thank you so much, Megan. And to all of our listeners, stay tuned. We will be progressing on and inviting some new uh, exciting guest hosts, guest co-hosts. So stay tuned for that. Chris, thank you again. Where can our listeners find you if they want to listen to your podcast? Uh, thank you so much. And congratulations, uh, 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 Megan. I'm, I'm happy we got to do one together. This is super fun. Yeah. Uh, so the best place uh, is Let's Chat Podcast net. We'll have everything under there. Uh, my podcast is Let's Chat with Chris Rebel. You can find that in anywhere you find podcast. Uh, and then I also co-host with uh, Bree, my, my 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 producer, business partner, friend. Uh, Let's Chat Live, which is uh, Tuesdays at 8:30 p.m. on uh, Facebook and YouTube, and that's uh, our video podcast. And then, um, you know, all the social media is just at Let's Chat Podcast or at Let's Chat Rebel. That's amazing. Thank awesome. you. And stay tuned. We have three live recordings coming to you on Friday where we will share um, a story of a young mom who will open up the conversation about her struggles with alcohol addiction. We will be talking with Dr. Gabor Mate, and we will be sharing the story of Carter Perry. Um, so definitely join us on Friday as well. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. Rise today. Take care, you guys.